What is the value of a human being? Well, the answer depends on who you ask. And raw materials, I guess is one way to look at it, were worth about 45, 50 bucks. Pulverized. Parts. You could sell a kidney for probably about $5,000, depending on where you are. You probably buy one for about seven or eight or maybe $10,000. Plus, you got to hire somebody to install the thing. But when it comes to the value of a human life, can a dollar amount be put on it? Well, in reality, there were those who did. And in this episode of Drinking with Dead People, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to visit a site where several hundred people are buried who were purchased. It's not very savory to think about such matters, but we will tackle that. And also, a little bit later on, we'll visit the final resting place of someone whose value, quite frankly, was immeasurable. Join us as we go drinking with dead people. Every stone marks a story. Interesting stories, people like you and I. History that should be recounted. Here we toast those you may or may not know who have gone on before us and left behind their tales to be told. Here we'll be drinking with dead people. When it comes to establishing a value of a human being, the 19th century in the United States was a difficult time. I'm talking, of course, about slavery. A war was fought over it, you know. (laughs) Those that wanted to maintain slaves took up arms to protect themselves and secede from the United States of America. Many aspects, those people would be considered traitors they were. It didn't go well for them. And the cost of human life in the course of the war we spoke about in the episode about the Confederacy that is buried here as well, members of the Confederacy. But there's another human toll to all of this, and that would be what this marker here is about. This is a marker that is dedicated to the 300 or so slaves that are buried here at Elmwood Park, right here below this marker and all around it relatively unmarked. We don't know who they are. We don't know their names. We don't know much of anything about them. Although there are efforts underway that are being tasked by certain individuals in a Herculean manner to try and identify all of those that were slaves, that lived and died in bondage. It's a stain on the American story, for sure. And even in the year 2020, we seem to still be fighting such matters. And as unfortunate as that is, we cannot forget those who are buried here and elsewhere throughout the world. You see, slavery was something where you didn't talk of slaves as being humans. They were chattel, if you will. They were property. They were purchased. There was a street here uh, downtown near the river called Auction Street, Auction Street has since been renamed to the A.W. Willis Street in A.W. Willis Bridge there. But Auction Street is where massive bales of cotton would be auctioned off to buyers as they came up and down the river or sold or whomever. And so were slaves. Hence the name of the street being changed because it's time to let some of this stuff go. These unnamed individuals that are here are really part of the toll from the Civil War. They paid with their lives. Some born into slavery, some brought into slavery. It was a long period of time. And they worked and they toiled and they died in those chains. And as the headstone and the marker here identifies that it is only until they find their grave, until they can truly be free, It's certainly something to keep in mind as we continue on our tale of American citizenry, our 
social experiment, if you will, of what the United States of America is and what it's supposed to really mean. And it being an ugly stain on the fabric of our country is just part of the story. But it should never be forgotten. And lessons that we can learn from these days and from situations such as this should always be kept in the forefront. The Egyptians used to have an interesting way to look at death. It was their indication that a person died three times when they physically died. When the, a second time they died was when their name was not spoken of anymore. And a third time when the last person who knew them died as well. Hence those massive monuments to keep them immortal, if you will. Sort of like this. It's important that immortality still exists in some way, shape, or form, even if only in by name. As I mentioned earlier, we don't know who these people were. And that's just it. They're people. They weren't treated as such. I'm sure in some cases they may have been, but the reality is they weren't. They were property. 300 to $400 would probably buy you a slave in those days. That's in 19th century money. Imagine what that would be now. So it was really the truly wealthy that threw their money and their weight around to acquire living human beings as property. Thankfully, it all came to an end thanks to Abraham Lincoln and a whole war fought over the whole thing. And thankfully, the party that should have won the war did, in fact, win the war and their freedom almost guaranteed. And like I said, here we are in 2020, still fighting those fights, still having those arguments. And it should always be remembered that people live and die and they leave stories. Sometimes they're not all that great. This is one of those. So always remember where it is our history has taken us throughout all these years. Written on the stone, Monument to the Slaves, final resting place of more than 300 enslaved Africans buried between 1852 and 1865 for a life of toil and bondage, only a nameless grave that awaits the thousands of those who died throughout the South. O oh, freedom, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to the Lord and be free. And to that, we must take a drink, don't you think? To all those who lived a very important life, although on paper, not so much. May their deaths never have been in vain. From this, we're going to go somewhere else. Not very far from here, as a matter of fact. It's just behind me. I'm going to introduce you to somebody whose relative was a slave and who elevated herself into a fantastic and yet magical position of a life of beauty and wonder. There are people in this world, perhaps you're one of them, who gets to live their dream. Sort of a running joke around the places that I frequent that it's when somebody will say, hey, how's it going, Rick? Living the dream. <laughs> I've been fortunate in that. Be able to live my calling. It hasn't been easy, but it's incredibly rewarding. Now imagine being a young girl from Yazoo City, Mississippi, you're expected to live some sort of a conventional sort of life based on the society of what Yazoo City, Mississippi would have to offer. But something's different. Something feels vastly different with you. And you decide to do something that is not expected. And when you do, the world changes. And it's just a fantastic story that gets to be laid out. Thus is the story of Bertha Bowman. She would later be known as Thea, Sister Thea. And her story of her very short life is filled with wondrous dreams that got to come true, considering a world 
that she came from and all of the things that went with it. And here it is, the story of one Sister Thea Bowman. Sister Thea Bowman was an incredible individual. Her grandfather was a slave. Her father, a doctor. She's buried here with her parents here in Elmwood. At the age of nine, she asked permission from her parents, devout Methodists that they were, if she could join the Roman Catholic Church, and she did. And from there began an incredible education that would take her all the way to a doctorate degree in the study of the English language. Her doctoral thesis was on William Faulkner, the writer. She would go on to make changes inside the Catholic Church that were monumental. She resisted racism and segregation inside the church to the point where she was actually able to make massive changes and to reach out across all faiths inside the church and to have folks embrace each other under one religion, embrace the differences of others. That's incredible. That's a big thing. For her efforts, she was given an honorary doctorate in religion in Boston. She spoke in Washington, D.C. She spoke all over the place. She even wrote a completely new hymnal dedicated specifically to African Americans in the Catholic faith. She once had an interview with, uh, with Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes and actually got him to say, black is beautiful. He was right, you know. Black is beautiful. And it's important to note, too, that when you have somebody like Sister Thea who spent her life educating those to embrace the differences of each other, that the, the world could be a better place. And it certainly was in her time. Sister Thea died at the age of 52. She had cancer. She was brought here to be buried with her parents here in Elmwood Cemetery where she rests now. And she still spoke of very highly amongst those African-American Catholics across the faith. She has now been designated by the Vatican as a servant of God. I guess it's one step short of being beatified and becoming a saint. In my eyes, she is a saint. Sister Thea, thank you. Join us next time as we wander the headstones of history and go drinking with dead people.